So welcome. It's lovely to have your company here today. We've got a fabulous permaculture film for you today and uh, a very wonderful opportunity to, to meet uh, the filmmaker. Well, not actually the filmmaker, but the star of the show. So this film today is called The Permaculture Orchard Beyond Organic. And it's a story of a permaculture orchard that was transformed from a very commercial monoculture farm, permaculture, um, not a farm, uh, just a standard monoculture farm to a permaculture orchard and the process that he went through. So it's an educational feature film. Uh, it's based in Canada. And the, the main uh, person in this film is Stefan Sabiwak. Now, Stefan is also a wonderful YouTuber, and many of you might have actually come across his YouTube. I'm going to drop in the links as we're going along as well uh, so that you can follow up his, his work. So what you'll see is basically a, a feature-length documentary that shares how to set up a film. So I'm just going to read out to you some of the key parts of this film. So he's going to talk about how he sets up the guilds, how he int integrates annuals into his orchard, um, how he does the pruning and the grafting, the ways that he weaves through the herbaceous layers, how he works with mulch in a, a 12 acre permaculture orchard. Um, what kind of trees does he choose and how and, and why? How does he deal with irrigation in that system? Um, and also really looking too at his sort of planting plans and his design system that he uses. And, and also really importantly, like how does he protect it from animals, from frost, from insect and fungi? So there's a lot in this film. Um, Stefan is an, an educator, a, a biologist, a landscape architect who's run a landscape architecture practice for um, a couple of decades. He's been a permaculture educator since the mid 90s. Uh, so he's a full wealth of knowledge. And I'm so delighted that at the end of this film, it will be morning, early morning time for him and he will be joining us and you'll be able to ask him directly questions. So, you know, if, if you're taking notes and you're not quite sure of something while you're listening to it, you have a chance to ask him. So I think that's uh, super exciting. Um, before I begin, uh, before I begin the film, I'd like to also acknowledge that I'm seated here on the land of the Gubby Gubby and uh, pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, if you are aware of the, the traditional custodians of the land which you're seated, I'd love for you to drop that into the chat as well as an acknowledgement and also to let us know, uh, you know, who you are, where you're calling in from and uh, just generally introduce yourself in the chat. So chat's down the bottom if you've, this is your first time to a Zoom session. Uh, you can just click that open and type. And I would love for you to be sharing in there, like if you notice as the film's going on, something that interests you, like point that out. So someone else might see, they might've kind of vagued out for a moment and then it brings them back into focus. Um, also, if you have any questions, um, be dropping them in there. I'll be keeping note of those as we go along as well. Uh, so just a final reminder before I get the show started to um, keep yourself on mute uh, and that way we'll be able to hear the sound beautifully. Um, if you have any issues throughout the film, um, sometimes if your internet's not so strong enough to stream a film, it might be a bit glitchy. So you might want to go out and come back in again. We will be recording uh, the conversation at the end to share and you'll be able to access that with Stefan. The film, however, is a licensed film. So um, I've made an arrangement that we can just share it for a short time afterwards if you want to kind of watch through again or if your internet drops out and you want to come back later and have a look. So I'll send you an email with all of that. So um, without anything further, um, welcome to the Permaculture Education Institute's uh, Permaculture Film Club, the first of 2023. And uh, let me just go ahead now and uh, get the sharing started. Enjoy. Fit in with the rest of society. Like my love of small spaces, my room ain't too large. I just live in a box underneath the house off the corner of my garage. But the edge is where it's at And it's easy to create And my mama always said If you're not living on the edge Then you're taking up too much space Been looking to settle down Find someplace nice 
where I can get my hand on some marginal land and turn it into paradise. Fantastic. And thank you for answering the questions in the chat. There's a lot going on in there. What a fantastic film. So um, how's it going, actually, by the way? I hear you're having some pretty wild and woolly weather up your way. Are you surviving all right? <laughs> it's winter, that's all. Actually, it's been a great winter so far. We're used to quite a bit colder and we've had we've had a lot a lot less other parts of the country it's like a swing so they've had it definitely a lot worse than we have but hey it's not your weather let's just say no no that's right. but we're used to it <laughs> yeah well there were so many tips and tricks and fantastic little snippets of like almost rhymes that you talked about there Stefan that really it's like a sticky way of understanding things the way that you share that and I, I can feel like there's a really buzz, there's a buzz in the room from, from watching this. Um, I know it's been a couple of years since the film was made. I wonder whether there was anything before we open up for um, questions directly to you, but there's anything that you'd like to add. Um, oops, we have someone sharing their screen. Just a minute. There we go. Yeah, the, uh, there are a few things, but most of it is there. What I would say from hearing people's comments is you you watch it once and there's just it's it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose because there's so much. It was basically a summary of uh, 20 years of learning condensed into two hours. And I've had people say, you didn't talk about a certain thing. And I'd go, geez, I'm sure I talked about it. And I'd rewatch that section. I go, I said it in two sentences. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we did mention the absolute essential because it was a lot to put into. We filmed for eight days. Oh, wow. And so it was, it was kept condensed uh, as really as tightly as possible. Yeah. Um, that's kind of why after the film, actually a few years after the film, I started the YouTube channel because they're still, I, I'm still learning things. And so just to keep up what's going on, uh, we're actually working on the very end of our, a master class now. So it's everything in the film, way more in depth, how some of the things all of a sudden, you know, I'll talk about way, well, where does that come from? You know, how did, come upon that well it gives you the story also of how i how i learned it or how i earned that knowledge you know because a lot of it is you kind of wonder how geez did you just come up with that no sometimes it was uh, quite a journey to get there so, uh, so um, yeah for the master class will you share the link with us so we can um drop that out and also um i can email that out to everyone as well who's who's had to leave already or who's registered but wasn't able to make it. So that would be fantastic. Um, the, other, the other thing to drop into the chat too would be your YouTube channel. How many, how many um, films have you got on your YouTube channel now? It's a phenomenal resource, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. If you haven't checked it out already, please do because it is so jam-packed full of such practical knowledge and skills about how to set up a permaculture orchard and more yeah over 250 holy moly yeah 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 well busy. So i guess people i don't i didn't get the beginning whether you had mentioned but we kind of got to know each other through our little mastermind group uh i didn't mention YouTube. that actually no that was great yeah yeah we uh, more uh it was justin rhodes it was uh pete canaris uh, uh, people who were getting going in youtube and we're just kind of hey this is our all our 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 area and how can we help each other grow our youtube uh, channels so yeah i'd yeah, like that, to start that over again actually that would that be was great very, let's let's do that let's very that helpful again. i know and, absolutely uh, um i'm uh, I'm wondering too whether um, you mentioned the masterclass. What other kinds of educational um, programs do you do you offer in permaculture, permaculture orchards these days? Do you have in-person classes? Do you, do people learn on site, or do you have 
like online programs as well that people can learn more about this on top of your YouTube channel? Yeah, well, that's why we have. Uh... Actually, we did. Let me. We did a pruning course a few years ago. Uh, Pruningcourse.com. That's because I found pruning is where people really need help. And the, uh, honestly, a lot of the information about pruning is really dated. Mm. Like the basics, okay, how you make the cuts, but uh, really things have evolved, and they've mostly evolved to save time. And that hasn't really come through, mainly because the the real leaders on that were in France. And they mm -hmm. said, and because of the language situation, it hasn't transferred. But for me, I work in both equally. So it's it's great that I've been able to take that. And that's what I really show in the film, because I had learned, I was so excited to learn about that. Um, we have a virtual tour. So those who uh, if you go to miracle.farm, we've got a lot of websites. You do. That's great. Thank you for sharing them all here. Uh, virtual tour was really to get people to know what's going on uh, without having to travel. <laughs> because we've had people just drop in from Australia. And I was like, the, uh, we don't have a tour today, but you know, you're here. You came pretty far. I'm not saying I do it on a regular basis but uh yeah that that's really to for people don't the idea was never for people to travel as far as they do to come see mm -hmm. uh, that's why we're doing so much in video in film and mm -hmm. so on because but people still you know all it is now is it's just gotten the trees have gotten bigger even watching the film it's like wow those trees are not that small anymore <laughs> um in fact some of them they've already kind of gone downhill since on some trees because some just don't live that long mm. uh, so that uh, that's yeah we did a lot of things online but I would love to go back I did a tour of New Zealand uh, just after the film mm. and this this time it would be New Zealand and Australia like oh, great. maybe maybe two stops in New Zealand and and one uh, maybe one or two in Australia would be great. So that mm. would be a, a teaching tour, basically. But that would be it. I'm trying to I'm trying to scale back because I know that if I could do something that is rather than in person, uh, and that just has like the videos. I mean, there's so much information, and it's out there for years to come. So mm. it's it's trying to get. I'm trying to avoid the customized situation where I'll teach it to a group, but if we're going to teach it to a group, we'll film it now because that way it can be used for, for more people. Yeah. I think that outreach possibility is, is so fantastic. And I really appreciate you coming here today to, you know, um, do some question and answer after the film as well. So maybe we should go to yeah, that. Let's go. Um, if anyone wants to, pop up their hand to have a chat. We'll also grab questions from the chat. And I know Stefan's been also um, answering some already. Uh, down the bottom, you may well have seen this. You can pop up your hand and it'll bump you up to the front of the line and I can easily bring you into our conversation. So does anyone want to jump in and, and ask a question directly? I can't actually see any hands. Oh, there we go. Lizzie, good on you. Okay, I'm going to bring you into the picture. There we go. I just, hi, Lizzie. Hi, thanks, Morag. Um, such a pleasure to have you here, Stefan. And yeah, I really enjoyed the film. And thanks for sharing your knowledge so openly. Um, just a question on your, your neck of the woods with um, any impacts of um, climate change and if you're seeing any differences. But, like where I'm living, it's particularly like an indicator tree is cherries. They're not doing so well anymore in our, our sort of temperate climate um, here around Canberra. So, yeah, it's just those long-term trends, what you've noticed. I mean, I've noticed, I've gone through a few years uh, on the property, so I've seen a few things. What I would say is we're probably due to have more of the extremes so when it's hot it gets hotter when it's cold it gets colder 
when it's wet, it can be wetter. When it's dry, it can be drier. So the way I set it up is in our climate, we could plant trees, we could get two nights of extra cold and cold here, for example, last year we had minus 34 C. So on, on most of our trees, that's not a problem. A few years ago, we had minus 38. Minus 38, that is a problem because we'll have complete rows of trees at that time when it was a monoculture orchard, it would kill complete rows. So when you lose, you know, 400 trees because, oh, it was cold enough that it killed them outright. So what I suggest for people now is plant something that is one zone. And I'm not sure in Australia if you want run in, if you have zones, but we have zones based on how cold it gets because cold is the killer here. And so I say, look, if you're in and we're in, let's say a zone five, plant something for zone four plant something that's even hardier. What happens is, look, and I've, I've lived it. Even last year, we had one cultivar that was recommended for France, uh, that came from France, that was recommended here, but it hadn't gone through enough years. And last year was cold enough that it froze right to the, right to the actually the snow level. And so plant something that when you get that extreme, it will stick with it because trees live a long time and you don't want to have something 15 years ahead. And now you're just starting to get these massive harvests and it just dies. Like that's all you can, if it dies to the roots, that's lost. If it dies to the ground, well, you can regraft as it regrows, but it's time that you waste. So try to get things that maybe like cherries don't like being flooded. And if you happen to get more flooding, uh, maybe there's a cherry that's known to be hard, uh, more resistant to flooding. So use those. It's just like buying insurance. Plant what will be insured against the extremes, because that's what we'll have. We'll have extremes of all kinds. Uh, and that, you just got to live with it. Trees have lived with it. I know whatever trees are native have gone through everything that you're going through. Otherwise, your whole native uh, vegetation will be destroyed. So if that happens, well, let's just say that your orchard is, is the least of the problems mm. if all the native trees die. So, and that's yeah. what I think we're heading to. I don't think we're heading to actual global uh, warming. I think we're actually beginning the start of a new ice age, which is something that no authorities, and let me tell you that, because no authorities would ever say that um, because the option is way too scary. It's much easier to say things are getting warmer because for some places, like in our part of the world, it, that's not a great, a, a terrible thing. But if we end up having a frost every month of the year, that is disastrous. And anyway, they would never admit that. But if you look up under the, you know, that's where we're headed. We're due for one. And, but it doesn't, it can happen pretty quickly, but it is always preceded by wild weather, let's just say. So, I mean, this whole idea of building in as much resilience as possible is, is sounds like the key thing. While I'm waiting for someone else to drop in there, drop in a question um, or pop their hand up, I'm, I'm wanting to know how much time do you spend? I mean, obviously a lot of time out there because it's an enjoyable place to be, but how much time does it take to maintain an orchard of that size in that way um, for you in a weekly basis? I know there'll be seasonal fluctuations, but right. generally. We, we, did a, we did measure that a, a few years ago because that's been, a, that's been a regular question. And so what we found was we divide everything into maintenance. Maintenance is what you have to do just to keep it going. And then we have projects. So if we're, oh, we wanna replant here, well, that's a project. You know, if we're gonna extend or if we're gonna to add to that's projects, but just maintenance uh, takes us around one day a week. So if somebody says, well, I can't do it. I only have weekends. Yeah, once it's going, you can't. And it's really uh, like it, it drops off the cliff. 
you have your first two, three years, which is so much work. And then if you're just maintaining that and depending how you set it up, the maintenance can be really, really uh, very manageable. We do extra just because, well, now we're, getting, now we're actually doing projects, which just makes the place look better because in the beginning it was just to get it out there. And so that's, you know, that's not necessarily maintenance that's necessary. It's just to improve it and, and get it going better. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I found the same thing here, even on a, you know, at a smaller scale, the amount that I do now is, is, is so little. I kind of feel guilty that I'm not doing more. <laughs> you know, It's just kind of doing it. So I've just been away for, Oh, uh, you know, almost two months, and I've come back, and I'm just gone out, and I'm harvested veggies, and I got went up to the chooks to get some eggs. And it's like, oh my gosh, well I've got to tidy up around the edges, but it's still going just fine. That's and it. oh look, there's the figs going on, the avocados are on their way, and oh my gosh, the limes are all, you know, like everything's just going on, and it's a bit, uh, you know, I need to do the tidying, but you know, there's stuff happening all over the place, which is just fantastic. I want yeah, to ask you, sorry, go ahead. That resilience is really important. And I think what Mollison said, and he had one program, or uh, there was a program years ago called In Grave Danger of Falling Fruit. Yeah, his first, and very I first think film. Yeah. It's, it's really, that's really the case. Set it up. And like you say, you can go away. That's the resilience factor. You can go away for a time. When you come back, I mean, your, your biggest problem is that you better watch where you walk. <laughs> Because you're in a climate where if you put in breadfruit and jackfruit and stuff, you really are in danger or coconuts or whatever. You know, the, the danger is the fruit are falling. And that's what that's the like the great thing with the film is that now <clears throat> I'm getting the feedback of people who have started and now their project is is getting going and so on. And that's the fun part. Like when the big part of the work is over and now it's like wow, you're coming, you're going in. And my goal is for people to enjoy and experience abundance. Because yeah. once you've experienced abundance, maybe you have two trees that are producing in that week that, my God, there's no way I can't, I can't eat all this. And then what happens is it forces you to think, okay, how can I share this? How can I, you know, what can I do? Can I have friends over? Can I, so, because now you have to share. And I think really, you know, I, I've been rereading Genesis a lot, the first uh, few chapters. And I, I really believe the, like the Garden of Eden was set up to make you get a experience what abundance is, where you're not having to, oh, I don't know, I want to have enough to eat. I want, no, it's, it's providing and you're really not working. And I think that's the distinction between, you know, when, when you have a garden planted that's tree-based and perennial-based, and now you're a tiller of the land and, you know, Cain tilled the land to get, well, when you till, you're, you're, it's a lot of work. But when you've planted trees, you're going, it's almost not fair. Like you're saying, you go and my goodness, there's all this food and like, I it, you think I not having to do anything you did in the beginning, but after you're not having to do much and you can really experience abundance. And I think that way that you've described too in the film about having the different lines where, you know, things are harvesting. So there's a plan that helps you in your, in your management and, and particularly if it's a commercial type of system, but I was just looking at all the different understory plants you have. I was imagining, you know, you had the sort of the Welsh onion type or, or the spring onion type of things. And there was all the herbs. And I could just imagine going along a bit of this, a bit of that. You could get your meals just by walking a few meters. It's just fantastic. And especially in your climate, uh, but absolutely like get a handle on what perennial vet perennial vegetables are amazing especially if you're any bit in a seasonal climate where you do have you know changes the perennials are spring plants they want to come out before the trees really leaf out a lot so you get all of this greenery and all this stuff coming out and you haven't even you're maybe just starting a garden and so I find perennials are a great complement. If you're going to grow a garden, have your perennial vegetables because it really extends your season so much more. 
Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely fantastic. And I wanted to ask you too, if you could give a little bit more information, because it's something that you weren't able to squeeze into the film about how your how you sell it, how it how you set up that system and how that works and has continued to work. Maybe it changed over COVID. Who knows? Because everything changed then. But um, yeah, how's that Actually, going? It was nice because during COVID, um, because we're a membership, we, we function as a membership you pick. It means people come to the farm and they pick, but they have to be members. So we sell memberships and we can close it. Uh, we do close it always after so many people. And that's adjusted based on how much we expect to have as a harvest this year. And so we'll limit how many families we allow. And then they come. And because it's, it's not like we've, I, we've seen you picks where there's 2000 people come in a day. Well, that's becomes a problem. We're not, I mean, we're not a hundred acre or hectare property. So having the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to limit, that's great. And so they just come, they paid the membership, then they come and they, whatever they pick, they just pay per weight. That's, a, I mean, it's really simple. I'm usually alone to, to run that. And it works fine, uh, gets hectic at times and, you know, closer to the certain periods where, oh, well, we've had a flush of people come in and then they're leaving. And, but it's OK. I mean, people get to know each other, too, because you tend to see people from year to year. And so it's it becomes like a, a large it's an extended family just about. Yeah. Uh, so that's the way we do it. And it, it's and it's a you... nice system. Do you find that that, I mean, just for anyone who's thinking about setting up an orchard as a commercial thing from a permaculture perspective, do you find that, that provides a good income for the for the work that you're putting in or is it sort of part of your streams of income? What How would you describe that? It's part of the streams. I, I mean, I've never tried to maximize uh, the return from the farm. In fact, because of all the online education and I... I really am more of a teacher than a farmer. And I've said to people, you know, I'm a terrible farmer because a good farmer does three things. They know when to, they know what they have to do. That's the first thing. You got to know what you have to do when, then, and when. You got to then, um, you, you got to know what to do, when to do it. And then the third one, you have to do it. <laughs> so I got the first two. I know what there is to do and I know when I have to do it but I can't always, I've got a few things going on and I can't always get done the things on time. Uh, but, you know, you have to know yourself what you enjoy doing. And I find, for example, the membership you pick is a great system if you're a couple, because chances are one person likes the production, likes the growing, and one person is more of a people person. And that's what you really need to be, uh, to be a, have a you pick. I, I mean, we go through it all. That's one of the things that was lacking. So in the master class, we have one whole course mm -hmm. is the marketing. And it's not just that one, but it, it deals with how to get publicity and how to get all these other things that to make it. And it absolutely can work. I've seen it work in other places. I just don't work it enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in an ideal situation. I'm about an hour I'm an hour away from Montreal. That's too far for that kind of you pick to work right. You have to be, the, the limit is within 30 minutes, 20 minutes is ideal. So the location is important because now you're talking about a retail farming, but it is nice when you get retail prices for your product. You're not selling through wholesale and complaining about the price. I mean, we've been raising our prices just because some things we don't have enough of and it's a really nice balance though isn't it and i think that's yep. the thing that you know you're using the principle of diversity in the income as well that you know you have so much going on plus you're surrounded by abundance of beautiful food and and uh you know uh, one of the things that you i was reading that you i don't know whether you still do this but you would you did 20 years of uh, designing people's landscapes as because you have a background in landscape architecture as well as biology do you still design other people's places as well or are you mostly just educating now yeah just educating the the design what I realized again is I'm trying to move away from a customized situation whether it's education 
or whether it's, you know, the design. I found that, you know, you could, I could spend a week, an intense week total working on someone's property. And I was like, like really one week of, of my life. It's not that it's wasted, but it's only one person who can really benefit well, them and, and family and so on. But I just found, you know, I'm, it's, it comes back to that old thing, you know, you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime, but you know, you give them fish and you feed them for the day. So it's, I much rather teach people to fish or teach people to, and, and that's another thing in the masterclass. We, one thing that I did in the in-person um, trainings, you know, whether it was New Zealand or wherever, was how to design. And we have a technique, we call it the magic model. And we show people very simply how you can design your own property. And we, you, that's what we did in the masterclass because design should be a democratic process. It's not just the specialists, just the, you know, the experts. No, it's not. It's, it's not that difficult, but you have to go through a process. And we show you the process, how, you know, how you set up for designing because it's, it's really worth it. And I have seen people do their own and it's, they're so excited. It's like, you've just unlocked the key to the kingdom for them. It's like, ah, I understand. And it works so well. And, and, and it's why, actually, yeah. it's I'm actually permaculture because of that, you know, yeah. that tool. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, it, it's, it, if you learn to do it and if you use the magic model to do a design, it's actually better than if a designer did it for you because you can spend the extra time. I mean, it, a lot of it is just time on task thinking, but if you're there and you see, like if you go and help someone with their property, you may spend the half a day, if that, walking the property and getting a feel for it, but that's only the half day in that season. Now you have to project, what would it be like here in the winter? What would it be like in the hottest, in the wettest? And I have a, a YouTube video I added to observe the extremes. And that's so important. If you have an extreme weather day, as long as it's not dangerous to be outside, be outside and, and look, go see what's going on. Cause that's when you learn the most. You see how, if it's, you know, if you have your, your, you've had a few very big rains, as long as it's safe to walk, be out there walking cause, and have, flat you know put stakes in places because you may go wow the water came all the way up to here well put it down because to remember that or to have so it, that's really the observing and and that's why it all starts with observation i mean so observation i know where to find one. my husband when it's raining he's always out in the garden with a shovel because he's kind of like redirecting water to go different places and opening up new pan, um you know pathways and things and it's it, yeah it's absolutely the best place to be yeah. when we're, you know. So I, I just want to check to see whether anyone, I, you know, we've been chatting away and I've been looking for people's hands up. Lizzie's got a hand up again. Go, go ahead, Lizzie. Drop on in again. I hear I'll pop you in. Oh, thank, thanks. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping everyone asks questions while we've got you here, Stefan. Um, I'm thinking of succession. Um, you talked a bit about when to make those decisions about the fruit trees after all that time invested. Um, but in terms of the whole system that you've created, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm working with, um, the context is I'm working with people trying to form a cooperative with some farm, older farmers who want to share their land. And that whole transition, like gathering all their knowledge and then finding a far, you know, a new farmer to give that to, and then working out all the detail about what happens if and when they want to move on, um, hopefully in a planned way. So it's often the the situation that permaculture, food forest owners, orchard owners find themselves in. So how how have you thought about that? I, I, that's a great question, Lizzie. I think one of the best examples that I've seen for that, where it's a phased succession, basically, where you allow new people in and the old and the older person is phasing out. And the really the, from everywhere I've seen, one of the absolute best examples of that is the 
share um, what's what's the exact name of the I think it's share cropping uh, or share milking in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And they have very well structured model where it's usually over a 10 year period. So you get the energy of a young person and they are working, doing the milking, doing everything. And they get uh, an increasing percentage either of the milk or the animals. And there's different ways of structuring, but you could do the absolutely the same thing in an orchard situation where you're basically transferring ownership over time by somebody working. So you want to phase out, you show them, you explain to them and you get them They're They're actually doing all the work, but they are working to take over that farm and you can structure it so that and that's why I say their examples are really good. I would say I haven't, but look into how they do it because it's contracts and it's, it's a, a very uh, well set up system that they use to transfer farms to non-family. And I'm, I mean, it's a different thing if it's family, but for non-family, how can you allow a young person to come in where there's land involved and they could afford it? Well, they are basically getting more and more of the revenue generating, which is the cows in the case of milking. So they're owning more and more cows and the milk return is what then will pay for buying the land. And so it's, it's structured and it's contractual and it's a way to transition that. Uh, and yes, absolutely. I would think a nice one would be to do that, but where it's like a co-op model, as you're saying, and there's several people, not just one person. Look, where there's a will, there's a way. And I mean, kind of our age, we're phasing out and we need people. And there's a lot less people coming up to take over. There's going to be, and the, the statistics are clear, I'm sure in Australia as well, there will be a huge, huge change of ownership of the vast majority of farmland, probably in Australia as well, over the next 10 years. Um, I think part of it will be farmers will simply keep their farms for longer because robotics is coming in. And I'm following all the robotics uh, advancements because people will get, take the labor element, the heavy labor element out of it, and it will be more management and decision-making. I mean, we will just because of the, the, we're not in overpopulation. It's, that's not the risk anymore. The risk is we're, there's not enough people to take over the land. And so uh, that will be a concern as well. There'll probably be the two, they'll, kind of the three models, family, uh, transferring to others and keeping and, and using more uh, machine-based systems to run the farm. I think it's a really great conversation to be had around this whole idea about access to land. I mean, there's a lot of people I know, young farmers in Australia who who want to farm but don't have any access to land. And so right. really finding a way to connect up people is such a big conversation to be had. And there's a really great network, um, young farmers uh, connect here in Australia, helping to create different models. So Lizzie, if you do a bit of research around that as well, please drop it into the, so within the Permaculture Educators Program and we have this hive, it's a network of people exploring different ideas and we just keep researching and throwing different um, resources that we can find around to help support this change. Um, but there's I just want to, sorry, go ahead. There, there's one more model that's kind of just starting out here. It's more like a land trust where land is bought uh, by sometimes even by investors and is then given on a 99 year lease, for example. And so it's like in perpetuity, it's not yours, but look, if you farm it for 99 years, chances are, you know, that that's going to be enough. And so that, that's, that, that is another system. There's going to be, and there has to be more models uh, that develop because that will be something absolutely coming up. 
Yeah, where I live here is an eco village and we have 80% of the land is common land. So we live on 640 acres, it's about 250 people. We have a collective dairy, there's food forests, woodlots, all different sorts of things. And if you want to do a particular project, you lease a piece of the land that's on the common land. So we each have about one, one acre that's our own to do our little food forest and garden. And the rest is this, this common land. So, you know, for us, we have 500 acres of, of common land. Half of that's forested and the rest is, is open for people to explore. So, you know, even from that idea of settlement design too, of thinking about well, how do you organise the way that people live together, um, you know, again, it's a little bit more complex, but there's a conversation here about rules and regulations and laws. I think a lot of the process of what we need to do, too, is to be kind of speaking it up and advocating and actually, you know, going in as a group to, to advocate for changes in these regulations because we need them. And, and I also really liked what you talked to about the whole process of democratic design and um I, like you, went through a background of, I have a background in landscape architecture, but I never really went to design, uh, to a design um, studio, because my focus has always been on this idea about, well, actually, like you said, supporting people to get their own designs happening, to support groups to come together to learn how to design together. So, you know, city farms, community gardens, community projects, school projects, like enabling design. I think we could, if we can support people to be getting into that design thinking, the observation, and being natural educators in that process too, um, we're going to sort of ripple this out so much further. I'm acknowledging that we're actually going... Um, it's quite late for many people here. And it was actually quite early when you arrived. Maybe we just take a couple more questions um, here. Uh, and also something I'd like to acknowledge too that I really loved about what you talked about in the film was your playfulness, you know, to experiment, to practice, to test things out. Often people get stuck in this thing, oh, I've got to know it first and to oh, have it all right. And then when it's right, I can put it into place. Like that playfulness is was so... Um, alluring in the film I loved that about what you talked about so thank you for sharing that aspect of what you do and you know that you learn by doing you learn by making mistakes and talking to other people going and visiting different farms and seeing what people are doing in a country that you know might have similar things you know that they can share with you um let, Danny, let me just say for um, everyone who's there who's here and who will watch the recording but absolutely uh I give you permission to fail. <laughs> it's it's so important if you think, oh, I can't. and what stops most people? I know because I had it and putting the orchard cured me of perfectionism mm -hmm. because perfectionism is paralyzing. It's like, it's, it's not good enough. I don't know enough, so I'm not going to start. And you know what? That's why I say it so often now, just start. Put two trios in. I call them trios now. I put two trios in and just start because you will learn with that. And look, even if all of them turn out to be, quote, mistakes, it doesn't matter. Just getting started and you can adjust. You know, the, well, look, is, wasn't that the one permaculture principle, you know, observe, interact, but also get the feedback loop going. Mm -hmm. Because as you do something, you get feedback. Oh, okay, that didn't quite work that way. So you adjust. And it's a constant adjustment. I mean, if you, if you, the weather is adjusting, so we're going to have to adjust. Mm -hmm. Get used to change because change is, is going to be the, you know, it will be the going forward modus operandi. It's really... And, you know, if it's a mistake there, you've got a plant that you could take some cuttings to move somewhere else. And I love, too, the way that you talk about, you know, the animals plant a lot as well. You know, I noticed that what's going on, that, you know, things come up where they've been planted by someone else and there's surprises. And then, oh, my gosh, that's growing well. And I've actually noticed the tomatoes that I haven't planted are the ones that are the best. The pumpkins, which I haven't planted, are the best. And so we're just noticing that kind of thing is really wonderful. Um, I wonder if um, there's a couple of questions here. Um, what fertilizers do you use for your fruit trees? A very practical question Steph, um, from Danny. And then if we'll just do that. And then we'll have one more question after that. And then we'll wrap up because um, it's a, so much information to take on. And um, I think, you know, we could keep um, asking you questions all night. 
well, it's night for us, but all morning. But uh... <laughs> fertilizers, actually, I, I have never used fertilizers in the orchard since it was planted. So that's kind of, that's unusual, but it's the design itself incorporates that element. When you put nitrogen fixing trees, when you put soil improving plants in the design, they are doing that. Is it enough? Probably not to have a, a, you know, the crop loading that happens, you need a certain amount. So Mollison suggested a nitrogen fixer, a fruit tree, a nitrogen fixer, fruit tree. That's probably closer. And some people have said, you know, you put two nitrogen fixers for each fruit tree. And it really depends on your soil. Uh, what we do is we run chooks. We have, you know, they go through. Uh, we have geese right now. And so we put some animals. Well, that's not negligible, their contribution. And in fact, we look at the feed we buy for them as basically a substitute to fertilizer. We're using feed to raise birds, to grow meat or to grow eggs, but they're leaving behind most of that feed value in fertility. So it's not negligible, it's an amount. When we use whey, which is the leftover from cheese making, that is not, it's not like the, the conventional products, which all it does is it kills something Whey doesn't kill anything, actually. It outcompetes, which is amazing how it operates. Plus, it fertilizes. It's a foliar feed. So even if it was just for the foliar feeding effect, it would still be worth using, even if it didn't help against certain diseases or all the fungal diseases. So it, it's just a different way of looking at it. Monoculture tends to have, you do this, but permaculture is each element should have three functions. You know that, so if I spray, so the, the first function is to counter a disease, but oh, you know what? At the same time, it's also fertilizing the plant, which is like, really? You, your products fertilize and they control? Yes. And, and so it's thinking through like that. If you run chooks, well, they're scratching, they're feeding, they're fertilizing. Oh, and they're giving eggs. And so that's, you know, it's the thing is, it's nothing new. People have used it in all climates, in all countries for generations. We just got infected with this monoculture thinking, which really is just a short-term experiment, which will ultimately fail because our soils are feeling the effect. Mm -hmm. So we need to go back to a more diverse uh, polyculture system. And I loved that you were saying, you know, don't spray anything that you can't eat. <laughs> it's a very good rule, you know, like common sense would tell you that. And uh, that's wonderful. Um, I can't see, there's lots of questions there, but my mind is going a bit boggled looking at, at all those questions. And I think you've answered many of them as you've gone through, but I, I, I'll ask the last question. I noticed as, as you were going through the, the, the orchard that there was patches where there was fruitful so um do you just allow that just to kind of decompose and feed all the material or is that what um, the, the animals are feeding on how do you deal with fruitful because there's lots of different advice that people give you about what you should do with fruitful in an orchard what's your advice on that it depends on the tree in a way um because certain trees in the case i saw a few questions about nashi Nashi in our, in, our, in our climate is great because there's no insects really that affect the fruit. So the, the fruit that fall, they are not infected. So they can stay. And in fact, what I do is I just let them fall. The, the chicks will pick up some and whatever is extra will actually just reseed new little seedlings in the years following that I can then dig up and transplant. So you can have a rootstock and so on, or you can just have a new nashi that is like, this is the best thing since uh, ice cream. So that's one. The other one for trees or fruit that can be infected with insects, I do recommend picking them up. And that's quite, can be quite a job. That's why when we had sheep running through and we had up to a hundred sheep running through the orchard in the early years, that is a huge time saving. So if you have a neighbor, for example, who has animals who can come in and I'll tell you, they will clean like a hundred sheep had, would clean up under 
a hundred trees in uh, in just a few hours because they can only eat so many fruit at a time and they know they can't overload but, but they'll eat a few fruit go back to the grass eat a few fruit go back to the grass ducks and geese ducks not so well geese work well turkeys work really well uh, so having animals do the work is is a great plus it's always a question of timing how long you leave them what else they can do but if you that's why just start get a few chickens you'll learn what they like get a few geese you'll learn what they like get a few turkeys you'll learn what they like and how they do and you know you may lose them they may get taken by something but you know what you've learned and once you learn that, you'll never lose that. Yeah. Yeah, that's such fantastic advice. And it's, and again, really common sense. I, you know, I think that's something that was just so evident throughout the film and all of your YouTube clips is, is this absolute common sense, just clear, simple thinking, straightforward approach. And, and it's, and it's just, once you hear it, you go, oh, of course, that makes sense. So I look forward to this um, masterclass. We'll make sure that we send out links to all of the things that you've sent in there when I um, send out the recording of this conversation. I want to thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. It's been an absolute delight to have you here and being in conversation with people and for us to be able to ask you questions. You know, it's one thing watching a film, the others is like, oh, I wanted to ask you about that. What? So that's been just wonderful. And I really appreciate you joining this monthly um, permaculture film club it's an always a free event it's by donation we collect the donations that come in and we send them to perma youth projects so that we were able to raise about 350 dollars from this particular event which will be sent and we'll start a permaculture food forest in a in a perma youth uh, club in uganda and so thank you uh for being the catalyst for that stefan um it's it makes a huge difference uh all every time we run an event like this um that we're able to then donate 100 percent across to to start a new project so thank you and thank you to everyone who's been here and to everyone who was able to donate you know you can also donate anytime as well to the ethos foundation so that's ethos um ethosfoundation.org.au and uh, I always send 100% across to all of the different projects and I know um, Henry's been asking there about um, whether he can join it I will follow up with you so um, get in touch that that'd be great all right well um, reluctantly I'm going to call this uh, show to an end um, again great gratitude to you Stefan for being here and to everyone and and for taking the time to make such a brilliant film you know I know what an effort it does take to put something like that together and also for all the effort in in creating your such valuable YouTube channel as well I hope everyone goes and checks that out now as well um, for everyone who's part of our normal programming I hope to see you all soon and um, yeah Stefan I hope we can get together and do some more um, YouTube uh, think tanking that would be just fantastic all right, everyone, take care. Have a great evening, day, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.